I don't know anyone in the world who, who doesn't go a bit funny when they see a Ferrari. It's not a motor racing film, it's about the romance of Italy and the red cars. You know, we all have this dream of something. I think film was, was my first interest um, when other people were going to watch LSD bands and things like that. I was down at a little cinema called the Turner Cinema that was in Stockton on Tees. And they used to show foreign movies, movies that weren't popular enough to go on the big Odeon or the Elite in Middlesbrough. And spaghetti westerns, French films, Italian films. I was absolutely fascinated by it. And I actually drew from them the love of music. I was happy doing little film things and things like that, rather than actually being a band with a 40 minute guitar solo. And it wasn't until I learned about Ride Cooler, which was through film, that I actually started to think seriously about slide guitar. First, it was going to be just an album of music that had the ten fantasies. But you start putting a little bit of dialogue in, and just to get you from one fantasy to another. And there were going to be just narration pieces. But as I did a bit of dialogue, and everyone started picking up and saying, We like the dialogue a lot. Why don't you just put a, bit of a, a little bit of a plot in it. So I wrote the comedy plot, which is pathos of selling ice cream in a cold place while dreaming of a hot place and red cars with this German count who's the little boy's hero. The main anchor of the plot is that Joe, the boy in the film, finds out that when he goes out on a night, and he's been making ice cream. Girls think he smells nice. And he twigs with, it's the famous family vanilla essence. What are you doing? In God's name, what are you doing? Well, hey, what are you doing? It was just an idea. Aftershave. Aftershave? Aftershave. And this last little piece, he pinches and he develops it into a, an aftershave that ladies adore, and he calls it La Passione. He then goes off and buys every Ferrari in the world and finds out that having a passion for Ferraris is the way to enjoy it, and that to own them and have the responsibility of owning, owning them spoils the passion. The story of the film is keep your passion high in the blue sky and enjoy it. I wanted it as an oil painting. I didn't want to make the mistake that a lot of guys have made with motor racing films of trying to be all things to all men and, and fill the technical vacuum. You know, this isn't about what kind of tires you use, what kind of brakes you use. And you don't find out till late in the film that there is actually a, a brutal element of ridiculous danger. 
the initial romance, the, the initial St. Paul on the road to Damascus experience is beautiful roads of a beautiful shaped thing in a warm air that smells of wonderful things. It's the fact that you're looking at a cold, wet, uncomfortable situation in a northern back alley. But you have seen once or twice on family holidays these roads that actually feel warm. And it's that kind of attraction that really starts to suck you in. Every heart's got its moment Written on its soul Just a minute in its lifetime Of a happiness untold My main inspiration is if you want film examples, would be Once Upon a Time in America with Serge Leone and Morricone, the way they combine with the music and narrative. And Terence Davies, who's my biggest hero. The pleasure in playing slide guitar, for example, in the olive oil sequence, uh, which I'm quite proud of, technically, the fact that there are two styles of slide guitar in that passage, one of them with a 16-piece Count Basie orchestra, which is something I had always wanted to do, but doesn't find its way onto a rock singer's album, you see, which is why I had to move in another direction. A lot of people listen to the orchestra and uh, just let it wash over, they enjoy it. They don't actually realise that you did every note, that you sat and you laboured, you toiled, you, you, you went to night school. Can I use a B flat on the cellos here? No you can't, it doesn't go that far. That's too high for the violas, you've got to go to violins. Should this be 16 violas? 16 violins. How does the harp work in juxtaposition with the timpani and the... All of this is taken into account. Every single note is written. It's like an engine. It's like a massive combination of mechanical movements. If someone said, where did La Passione start? It started with that music. I never know why some things have been hit. The best example of that ever was Road to Hell. Uh, Road to Hell was made with a sister album so that I could tell the guys who were first going to listen to Road to Hell that I said, look, there is another album. If you don't like this, we can jump to the other album straight away. First, I want you to listen to this because I wanted them to relax when they heard the windscreen wipers, the traffic reports. You know, I was already, although I didn't know it, filmmaking. Uh, I wanted them to absorb the rain, the, the motorway traffic noise. I had no idea at all in my life that this album would be the biggest album I ever made. Stood still on a highway, I saw a woman by the side of the road. With a face that I knew like my own Reflected in my window Well, she walked up to my quarter light And she bent down real slow A fearful pressure paralyzed me in my shadow 
said, son, what are you doing here? My fear for you has turned me in my grave. I said, mama, I come to the valley of the rich myself to sell. She said, son, this is the road to hell. I think it's autobiographical in the same way that a Scorsese movie is generally in Brooklyn. And yes, I come from an Italian background. Yes, I come from an ice cream background. And yes, I'm completely smitten with Ferraris. Um, the actual development of the story itself isn't, isn't me at all. I never became Joe Maldini. Surely, do you own a Ferrari? Do you live in a wonderful place? And a smile on your face is a joyful after happy ever after I had a very very bad year in 94 with a series of illnesses all my uh, emergency operations were in France and I was in a, a bad state I can smile now but uh, as soon as the last stitches of the fifth operation in seven weeks were out and they allowed, they took all the pipes out and allowed me to get on an, an aeroplane and fly back to England. I got on the plane and I was mentally in a bit of a dodgy state. I was three and a half stone underweight, um, very, very weak. I knew I had two more operations to do in England. I was pretty down. Who gets on the plane but Shirley Bassey? Yes. I always said I never meet anybody interesting. 40 years of flying, I've never met anybody interesting on an aeroplane. And suddenly Chris Vierges comes up to me and introduces himself. And, and we start talking. And, and, and we talked, and we talked until we arrived in London and said goodbye. And uh, we exchanged telephone numbers and addresses. And then months later, he sent me uh, a tape of two songs called Sh Shirley and La Passione. I mean, that. I finally met somebody interesting on an aeroplane and something great came out of it. And she's even got a letter from a little boy from the north of England. She couldn't believe it when she read the script, asking her, and it, the, the letter was addressed to Shelley Bassey, Monte Carlo. You know, just, I just love it, it's great. Do you own a Ferrari? Shirley, do you own a Ferrari? A lot of people think that it's something that's emerged in the last five or six years, maybe with the success that I've had in music, that's afforded me the chance to look at motor racing, to, to look at Ferraris. They don't know that it's been there dormantly or not dormantly all through my life. Just as one would say, yes, I'm a Catholic, but I don't go to church on Sundays. I always would, if someone said, are you a Catholic? You would immediately answer, well, yeah, I am. You've never thought about it consciously, but subconsciously, it's constantly there. I know two words of a foreign tongue. La passione. And this, Joe, is all yours. Enjoy.
enjoy it. Love it. Let it keep you from the hurting wind. Let it blind you from what you can't bear to see. Let it be in a world otherwise empty. A reason. A reason. Wolfgang von Trips had, had a Darth Vader type image to me when I was young. He was the first to wear one of the silver helmets that was a, a modern looking helmet. Whereas the other guys had peaked caps and looked rather happy in the cars. Von Trips, for some strange reason, always looked quite stern. And it's me filling in as a boy, a complete unreality, that he was some kind of steely, dastardly count from Germany. It's the classic hero worship thing. You, you see that all these people don't have the problems that you have in, re, in normal day-to-day -day life. You, were, you don't imagine that they would ever have a stomach ache, that they would ever have something wrong with them. One of the fascinations I found out beyond La Passione is how all these guys did have troubles. As a lot of them had terrible injuries that they carried all their lives, unbeknownst to small boys who think these guys don't have any problems. Every time I'd gone to Cologne, in the many, many, many tours I've done of Germany, I'd always looked as I walked into the hotel at the air around me and thought, this castle's not far from here. Um, of course, you've got to move on. After the, you've got to be up early the next day. We had a day off one day. Um, we were doing two enormous Cologne gigs at a sports stadium. So we had the day off, and I just got in a hire car and drove, followed the signs for Kerb and Horham, and got lost, and asked someone if they knew where Wolfgang von Tripp's castle might be. No one knew who the hell this von Tripp's was. But somebody, a guy at the petrol station, did say, there is a racing driver's museum down the road. I had no idea about this. And followed my nose and there was this tiny little museum, two people in there and the entire personal um, items of Wolfgang von Tripps contained within this museum and it was quite, quite chilling because I'd only ever seen still photographs of him up until then, very little in movies. And to see him with his mother and father, to see him as a child in a little tin car. I mean, the whole film almost wrote itself from that point. I've often found myself, while we've been editing the film, just looking at these movies and thinking, God, he did have a good life. I mean, I didn't even know when I was 10, 11, that he had that kind of life. I mean, it really was a, a fabulous life. I think we'd all be happier if we didn't know too much about all our heroes and stuff. We'd enjoy it more, without a doubt. It's just like the old Hollywood stars. Um, Wolfgang was a classic case of being someone who was completely devoid of tabloid gossip. So he always will be a count who lived in a wonderful castle who drove Ferraris. I did have this romantic inclination last year when I wrote the film that maybe I would, apart from the art of making a film and learning how to make films, 
I always thought that maybe I'd get to drive a few nice cars because we had to make a film. And it's the only thing I haven't done. I've even been T-boy, but I haven't been one of the drivers. This is 156 Shark Nose, uh, Dino engine. And this was, this is a replica of the cars that actually raced in 1961. There are none of these left in the world. I wish there was, because it would have been nice to have used a, a real one that was actually there. We were going to build a film prop. The film prop was going to cost an awful lot of money. Having got so surprised at how much the film prop was, I was talking to a Lotus 7 racer who race, races with me, in, with Lotus 7s, who builds Lotus 7s, and he said, for that price, Chris, I can build you a shark nose. There's not that much to them. You know, they're an old car. And so that's what we did. The one that's on the top of the stairs is a 330 GTC, which was bought as scrap. It, was in a it had no doors or anything. And we give it the body that it would have had in 1961 in Le Mans. I have to admit that building them has been part of the fun making the film, especially this little baby, because I've imagined this, this car in my own head and thousands of other people have as well for 30 years, and here it is now. looked so different compared to the rest. They were the only ones with this shape, whereas all the others had flat noses. And they were the only ones that were this kind of red. What colour are they, Dad? Red, sir. Blood red. For insurance purposes, I wasn't allowed to drive either car on the film. I actually am hoping what will happen is I won't see it till it goes back to Wolfgang's museum, which I promised them, which is only right in return for them giving me Wolfgang's private footage. And then the museum is not far from Nürburgring. And I hope one day, Paul who built the car and myself will just take it to Nürburgring and we'll have our day in the car then and it'll be Wolfie's car then. It was an intensely personal thing for me, this. One of, the, one of the strange things that occurred during this film, which makes it yet again, in yet another way more unique, was that I wasn't technically anything on the movie. I was everything on the movie, and yet I didn't actually have an official standpoint. Normally a writer would be paid for his script and would never go to the shooting. I was there all the time, and yet I didn't actually have any power. I felt like Tinkerbell. Some of the, the, the young crew used to call me Tinkerbell because they couldn't get rid of me, but they couldn't fire an air gun at me. Joe, in the film, has returned to Monza to take his last look at everything he's been so obsessed with over the years. And he goes down to the point where Von Trips' accident was. And as he does that, the ghost of Wolfgang von Trips appears. But what we're having to do technically is so that we don't go all the way around Monza and then all the way again. Once Joe's been by, we send the ghost by with what with different lenses. So when von Trips comes through, it's all in haze and fog. And we're gonna have to put another lens in by looks because the sun's shining. We didn't want the sun to shine. <laughs> This is why I'm here. This is the wild garlic of Monza. You chop it up, a bit of real olive oil, 
black pepper, a bit of fresh gram padano parmesan. You don't need meat. Uh, papa, papa Italian. Papa Italian. Too English. No, no, so perché. Beh, io prefero Italian. No, ma no, no. I do now know how to make a film because I've been keeping a, a little notebook every day and I haven't missed a day anywhere. And I've been asking, well, is, is this how it would be if the budget was bigger? Should we have had more money on this? Should we add, did we spend too much on that? Um, and the whole procedure, the technical procedure. I, I now can say to everybody, yes, I know you make a film now. We arrived at Fiorano, and uh, Fiorano is famous, and I always remember this from photographs all through my life, of the poppies in the middle of the field at Fiorano in, in Maranello. And we got there, and they weren't out yet. And so I actually jumped in a car, went to a florist, and bought some poppies, plastic poppies, and stuck them in the field in Fiorano. And I always remember seeing Giorgio at the head of the circuit at Fiorano, wondering, what the hell this madman was doing. He was planting plastic poppies all over the, the Ferrari racetrack, you know. When the grey skies turn to... I think the tabloids will probably just see it as rock singer Ferrari AWOL completely out of control. I think, I hope that the film fraternity will recognise where the, my influences have come from and what kind of film I've tried to make. And as long as they see it as that, I don't care what the others think anyway. I have to always be looking for a new idea, creating. I'm always looking out to sea. I'm never looking back to port. And hopefully that's the way Chris Reed things will happen in the future, that you will wonder what he's going to do next with his music and his film ideas. Meet me on a bright and windy day When the breeze has blown the grey skies far away High up on a hillside when the sun comes shining through And the grey sky Turn to blue.